Hello and welcome to the Dapper Gaffer channel. I'm Josiah Shostrom. We're at City Stage Studios and today we are in the photo lounge. Just uh, for a little different vibe. But uh, we're looking at the Nanlite PavoTube 230XR today. Nine, uh, Nanlite was kind enough to send this uh, to us to check out. Um, I've been using PavoTubes for a while. You're probably familiar with them. Um, they've had a couple different iterations come out. The two was a big step forward from the original Pavo tubes. I think they were the original ones. And then the R, which we're looking at today, um, adds Lumen Radio. Why is Lumen Radio a big deal? Because while they have a great app, Nanlite does, to control um, a lot of features in these things, if you use other manufacturers' lights, which most professionals do, those aren't gonna work with your app. Lumen Radio gives them a common language, so you can control multiple manufacturers' units with one DMX board, and it's really become the standard for wireless control. The, the original Pavo Tube 2s had DMX control ability, but you had to plug in a dongle for it to adapt to a physical uh, DMX cable. This has wireless built in, which is, which is very handy, and we'll demonstrate that in a bit. All right, since the primary differentiating feature of this fixture is the wireless DMX, I figured we'd jump straight into that. Wireless DMX, CRMX, uh, Lumen Radio, we're talking about the same thing with all those terms, but essentially it's a protocol to control lights that was developed in like the 80s, I believe. It was originally developed for stage lighting. We use it in film production now as well and the wireless is the same control protocol, but it's transmitted wirelessly, obviously. So let's grab this board here. Excuse my messy little setup here. This is just a little handheld 12 channel DMX board. Nothing special, pretty cheap, I think. Um, it can operate on a battery. And then this is a little uh, Moonlight Lumen Radio dongle that can be a transmitter or receiver, depending on how you set it up. Right now we're using it to transmit this, the signal from this very simple DMX board wirelessly to this fixture. As you can see, I have it set up on channel one. And a quick overview on how DMX works. I've gone into the settings on the tube here, set it to channel one, and uh, whatever channel you set your fixture to, that'll correspond to the channel on the board, and that's where it will start. That's the first channel what, whatever channel it's using, that's the first channel, channels it's using, that's the first channel it'll start on. So in this instance, I have it set it to 8-bit uh, CCT mode. It will use three channels to control it, starting at one, so one, two, and three. One is the intensity, two is the color temperature, and then three is the green magenta shift. As you can see, like that. Now the beauty of this, is we can control other manufacturers' fixtures at the same time. If you look behind me here on the wall, that's not sunlight coming through. That is an Aperture 600D with a spotlight attachment on it. And we've just kind of shaped it down to look like that scratched light on the wall. I'm gonna switch over to channel seven here. I've got, I've got 12 channels packed into the and six slots, so that's why I had to change banks there. Now, on channel seven, you can see up in the rafters there, I've got a light panels, uh, Gemini one by one soft, also taking up three channels in eight bit CCT mode. So I can warm up, warm that up, cool it down, adjust the green magenta shift. And then if you look outside this window here on channel 10, again, eight bit CCT mode, we've got a Vortex 8 out there that's throwing some light through the window. And on those three channels, starting at 10, so 10, 11, and 12, I can control that light. You can see that 
green and magenta coming through there as well. That's four different manufacturers' fixtures, all controlled by this very simple board that you can get pretty cheap. Now, I could control all of this without the wireless component as well by just plugging in five pin DMX cables, which is an option, and sometimes there's instances where you want to do that. Uh, the wireless component is just, <laughs> obviously you don't have to run as many cables, so it's a, it's a pretty nice feature to have. And you may be wondering, well, can I just do that with an app? And the answer is no, not really. You can use an app uh, like Blackout or something to control fixtures, but it's still using the DMX proto protocol. Um, but like if you're thinking about um, NAM Lights uh, app or Aperture's app or any number of lighting manufacturers have apps that connect to the lights via Bluetooth or or I think some of them use Wi-Fi even. You get a lot more control over the light because you know they can engineer it specifically for that light and you know control it however they want with the GU, with the graphic interface, user interface. But it's basically one manufacturer's for one manufacturer's app controls that manufacturer's fixtures. In my world, uh, as a working gaffer, owner op gaffer, I also have a small GE shop. I have a whole plethora of different manufacturers' lighting fixtures. Um, you know, different people want different things for different projects, so I can't be all in one ecosystem and expect to be able to control all my stuff with an app. The other downside of an app is the dependability of it, and I'm not trying to just trash talk apps because I do, I do use apps sometimes which is when I need to be quick and it's just maybe a very simple, you know, one or two light setup or, some, or there's one or two lights I want to control and they happen to be the same fixture. I will use apps, but when I do that, I like to have a separate dedicated device to do it, like an extra iPad or something, because just trying to control it from the phone I have in my pocket, I just find it not to be a very stable and dependable way to control the fixtures. You know, you shut it off, whatever you put it in your pocket, you turn the app back on, it doesn't necessarily always connect the first time. Time is everything on set, so if you're there fiddling around trying to relink or whatever, it's just not a good look for you as a gaffer or a DP. <laughs> Pluses and minuses going DMX versus an app control, but um, as we've demonstrated here, doesn't matter what who makes your lights, if they have that DMX protocol, and preferably the wireless DMX protocol, um, you can control them all from a very simple unit. It takes more setup time. Uh, the, the, other, the other difference is we're, we're only using three channels per light at the moment in 8-bit mode, but it can take up a lot more channels too. Like you could, there are modes where they take up a dozen channels or more. So that can be a complicated thing to map out and kind of remember what's going on or you have to label on your board or what have you. I wanted to jump in here quick and mention something I didn't really go into on the day. But regarding controlling multiple manufacturers fixtures with wireless DMX but doing that with an app versus like a physical board with sliders on it, there are some great apps out there that do that. Uh, Blackout and Luminaire are two of the big ones. There's some other ones out there, I, I believe, as well, that you can control with a graphic user interface on an iPad, for instance. And there's profiles for these lights. I believe they're you know, developed by third parties, largely, uh, that do a lot of the complicated programming for you to be able to give you more control over these lights in situations where you're using a plethora of channels, for instance, and giving you a, a way to control you know, the effects and the colors and things like that in a much more simple fashion than then you're going through and assigning it to physical channels on a board. The downside of it is you need an interface device to convert uh, the signal from your iPad or computer uh, to wireless DMX. And that could easily set you back a couple grand plus the price of the iPad and the price of the software. And I think the software can run like 500 bucks. So you, you could be a couple few thousand dollars deep into having that level of control. Is it worth it to you? It depends on how often you use it, how often that you, you think that you're going to need to be able to, to control these fixtures in that sort of environment. Is it uh, way easier than uh, programming them on a board? If you have a complicated lighting setup, absolutely. So for me, typically I'll go for a more simple, simple board uh, if I just have a, you know, a couple few lights that I maybe need to control 
remotely because they're difficult to get to. Maybe they're rigged in the rafters or they're up in a condor or something. It just gives you a simple way to be able to increase or decrease the intensity, you know, c control the color temperature, kind of like what we were doing in our little demo. Um, but if you need to do something more elaborate, uh, more quickly, or, or more uh, complicated effects, app-based DMX control is probably the way to go. Just be aware it's going to set you back some coin. Back to you in the photo studio. There's, there's pluses and minuses, uh, whichever way you go. The other thing that you can do with DMX is say that you had maybe a, a dozen of these fixtures and you wanted to control them all at the same time. It's a very simple thing to do. All you have to do is set them to the same channel. So let's say we had this starting on channel four. You would just set all the ones you want to control on channel four to the same number and then you'd be able to control it with the one fader. Little quick DMX overview there, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. But the fact that they're putting wireless DMX in these now, I think is a testament to the fact that they're going more after the pro market, and I'm happy to see that. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a feature that we have just kind of come to expect in quality lights these days, and I'm glad to see that they've added to this fixture. I'm gonna set that light outside to a little more normal daylight come, color come through here. So let's talk a little bit more about the Pavel tube in general, um, form factor. So this is a fixture I've actually been using for a while. Here's a beat up one. See all those beautiful scratches on there? From getting used and abused. I don't know what this uh, tape on here is talking about. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a great form factor fixture. The, the Titan tubes you know, really made ripples in, in the industry and people found new ways to use them. I think the beauty of it was just that they're, uh, they had the integrated battery. You, can, you, know, you don't have to plug them in for a while anyway. Um, lots of control fixtures. Uh, Let's get the different pixel areas as you can see in rainbow mode here. And they're just, they're fast, easy to use. You can get little modifiers for them. Mananlite makes some nice uh, clamp-on, eight crate sort of deal that can go on here to can control where the light is going. Yeah, they're, they're a nice fixture. I think, and I th think they hit a really good price point for the performance that they offer. Uh, Titan tubes run a hefty amount of money um, for a kit of those. These, I would say, can do most of what the Titan tubes can do, and some things I think they even do better. These are probably my go-to tube fixture to grab because of how affordable they are and the features that they packed into them. I've used Titan tubes and other manufacturers' lights on a number of different occasions, but this is actually the, the tube that I ended up going with uh, in my kit. So there's the Pavo Tube 30X right next to the Where's the name of this thing? Right here. See that? 30X, 30XR. Same form factor. I love that they've put these hexagonal or octagonal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. octagonal ends on here. Because a lot of times I'm just putting them on the ground or who knows what, and this gives them the ability to kind of lock into a position without rolling away, which is a common issue with uh, <coughs> Titan tubes, for instance, or some other manufacturer's lights. So that's kind of a nice feature. It's got quarter 20 mounting points on it. I should probably be looking at the new one, but I think it's yeah the exact same form factor as the previous gen. Really the difference is that lumen radio, which we already talked about. Another way I like to use these lights, even if I'm not actually going to run them wirelessly, Say you're doing a setup that's gonna last half the day or most of the day, you're running at a high intensity, you're gonna to wanna to plug that in. But the beauty is you can test the light, you can throw it in, you can Hollywood it, you know, find where, you, where the DP likes what it's doing, then you lock it off on a stand and they can kind of start getting their stuff framed up, whatever they need to do, they can even start shooting it and then between takes, at some point, when it's a good time, you can run power to it. So it's, it's a lot faster way of working. Even if you plan to plug it in eventually, it's nice to be able to throw it up there, turn it on, it's ready to go, and then run power later. But these things do have a pretty good battery life on it as well, especially if you're not running them at 100%. A little tip for you when you're running lights on batteries, 
they really eat up significantly more battery life when you run them at 100%. Dialing them down to 90 or even 80, it gives you a lot more life, so. The other thing I like about these lights is the ability to pretend like you're a Jedi Master. Which is the first joke anyone makes when they see these things come out and they're uh, a layman, an extra, someone who's not on set regularly. Oh, it looks like a lightsaber. Yes, we know it looks like a lightsaber. Dun, 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 dun. So situations I, I would use these in, I use them for like a quick backlight pretty often. It's a, if, you like, if you like soft backlights, kind of non-sourcey sort of backlights, it's a great option for that, especially running it horizontally. Pretty easy to put on a, you know, put like a tube clamp or a cartilina or something on there, just boom it out on a C-stand arm or, or a C-boom or something like that. Uh, makes a nice backlight, especially if you put the uh, egg crate on it to control you know, where it's going. That's a nice option. I like to use it for integrating into sets sometimes. Like just a few weeks ago, I was using some of these inside some white coroplast pillars that were kind of built into this uh, mock TV set. And I was able to pop those in there. They work really well, able to change the colors and kind of make it look like this little TV set vibe. They're great for putting it on, on like lighting a bar, like behind the bottles or, or things of that nature. Kind of set integrated sort of lights. They're great, great like that. And again, the fact that they have built-in batteries, you know, you can pop it in there, really test it out before you run a bunch of cabling to see how well it's gonna work. Probably not something I, not something I really use for key light. You know, I have on occasion, you know, maybe banked a couple of them like in an old Kino housing or something and, you know, put some diffusion over it or something for, for a key. But uh, not, not my go-to for a key light. Sometimes I'll use it for like a quick fill, maybe grabbing like a, an ultra bounce like this one we've got sitting here or a beadboard or something and then just kind of <laughs> Hollywooding that, you know, bouncing the tube into a fill. As we're as we're you know moving around set or something like that, uh, the beauty of the lights is that they have the integrated battery, and they're just really easy to grab and go. So, sometimes I'll even tape them up like inside a cabinet or something like that. They're a little heavy for taping, in, in my opinion, but uh, in general they're 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 light enough. You can you can rig them easy enough. Usually you don't necessarily have to tape them. On the end here, if you can see, that's where the power goes into. And then that's, if you want to do a uh, physical DMX, there's a little dongle they sell that plugs into there, adapts it to. Pretty sure it's five pin, five pin DMX coming in and out. You can daisy chain them together like that. So something, uh, something I could do, say in my situation, or if you have some of the, the non-lumen radio lights, you could get the little dongles. Say you had these rigged up in a grid in a studio or something, you could get, little dongles, use one of the, the new wireless DMX lights, and then you could daisy chain all your other fixtures together with just regular old DMX cord, and you could control them all wirelessly just because you have the one wireless one sending the signal onto the next ones. That's a way you could uh, incorporate them both together. All right, so this is my highly not recommended way to rig these lights, just sitting on the table like this. All I as you can see, they do balance like that, and I have on occasion worked them into a scene that way. But that's been our uh, little review of the Nanlite uh, Pavotube 230XR, which is the Lumen Radio version of this existing light that I've been using for a while now. We do get to keep this light, so thank you Nanlite for that, but uh, we're not sponsored by Nanlite, and uh, we were given license to say whatever we want about it. And I think we mostly said good things about it because I think they're great fixtures. So I'm excited that they added Lumen Radio to this, to this light. That's definitely something that was missing. Excited to be using it in more um, scenarios on set because of that. Thanks for tuning in to the Dapper Gaffer channel. Dude, you should do a tip, a men's fashion tip. <laughs> and for your tip of the day with men's fashion, make sure your belts always match your shoes. Brown leather with brown leather, black leather with black leather, everything in between. We'll catch you on the next one.
for this, this uh, shaft of light on the wall, we've got a 600D uh, with the spotlight attachment on it, and you'll notice there's an open scrim cutting half the light on there. Why do we do that? Well, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. It's very not convincing as sunlight when you have a light like this raking across the wall, and it's a lot brighter on this side, closer to the fixture, than it is on that side, far away from the fixture. Why? Because of the inverse square law, and uh, if you think about the sun being so far away, you don't get that proximity fall off that you do in this scenario where it makes a big difference how far we are away from the light. So, what that scrim is doing for us is just helping sell the illusion better that that source is farther away. And let's just pull it out quick just to kind of show a comparison of what that wall looks like without the screen there. So take a look at the wall, push that out. See how that side of the fixtures is way brighter and just looks like fake? Put that in halfway, much more convincing.